Hello and welcome back to my channel. In my last video, I left a comment about winter gardening the build of my next prosthetic hand. The comment generated enough interest that I'll try making this build into a series. So I guess I should change the intro of this video to one that's more appropriate. Welcome to Missing Parts Monday. In this episode, I'll be outlining the design and features that I plan on including in this next build, along with the insight of what worked and didn't work from previous builds. So let's get started. The socket. To be honest, I'd love to go with an osseo integration setup, where you have the little titanium pins inserted into the marrow of your bones, and then affix the prosthetics to them, rather than dealing with the socket at all. But unfortunately, the technology isn't available or recommended for hands just yet. Probably because of the huge risk for infection at the pin site because of the permanent open wound. Or the whole when a pin goes bad, it goes really bad, and you end up needing a revision surgery. So until there's a pintegration solution for hands, I'm stuck dealing with everything that goes along with relying on a socket interface to join the mechanical to the flesh. Originally I was planning to use a wire socket, similar to what I've used in the last two builds. But with all the inquiries that I've received since showing what I've been doing to meet my needs, it's really left me trying to solve a very complex problem. The problem that I've been trying to solve is with just how personal and custom that the socket needs to be, and how to get all the details and information that you'd need to fabricate a socket without actually having the user present, or dealing with a bunch of back and forth in order to get the perfect fit. Say I've been contacted by someone from XYZ Central America, and they need one of my devices. If they can't fabricate a socket to fit their hands, don't have one from an earlier device, or can't travel to my shop so that I can build one for them, unfortunately there's no way that I can help them. As I've said in so many of my videos, the socket is the most important part of any prosthetic. And if the fit isn't absolutely perfect, the device is going to spend more time on a shelf than attached to a residual limb. And a socket that fits today may not fit tomorrow, depending on how much water you drank and retained yesterday. A proper fitting socket needs to be rigid enough to give the user a sense of proprioception and yet still have an amount of flexibility to accommodate the swelling and shrinking that a residual limb naturally experiences every day. The way I usually accomplish this is by incorporating a silicon liner to take up any extra space between the hard and movable socket and the squishy bits of the residual limb. Setting up a socket for a prosthetic hand is a complex and interactive process. One that is nowhere near as simple as placing an order for a new pair of shoes. But what if it could be? That's the rabbit hole that I'm currently exploring. A super minimal socket that has a hard loop around the end of the metacarpals that forms the anchor point for the fingers and the other components of the device go to stabilize that ring and keep it from rotating as the fingers articulate. It's still super early in the prototyping process and it needs to be proven out to make sure that it's strong enough to be valuable in real world scenarios. It really doesn't matter how cool the prosthetic is if it can only pick up 15 pounds. So that initially takes care of the socket. Moving on to the fingers. I really like the fingers from my current hand. The asymmetry, the minimal design combined with the way they articulate and the similar dimensions to my natural fingers make them a definite carryover to this version. Another carryover from the previous hand is the ability to cycle through grip patterns. During the time that I've been using the 158 hand, I've really enjoyed being able to cycle through different grip patterns depending upon the situation. That being said, as cool as the feature is, it would really be nice to be able to turn that function on and off as needed. Another thing that I'd like to incorporate is to be able to easily add, remove, or change the order of the available patterns. So the TLDR, using roughly the same fingers as this hand, keeping the grip pattern selector, adding the ability to turn it on and off, and changing the design so I can easily switch the available grip patterns. Next, the drive. On the 156 hand, the motion of the fingers was controlled by a two-lever whiffle tree through a reversing lever. On the 157 and 8 hands, I used a more complex system with a miniature differential and chain whiffle tree. The advantage of this setup is that adjacent fingers can be at their opposite maximum extremes, whereas with a linkage system, the positions of the fingers are constrained by the bars that make up the second stage. For this build, I plan to use the chain whiffle tree for the second stage. For the first stage, I'm still working through what's going to be the most reliable system with the least amount of maintenance and fewest part count. 
I do know that I'm not using a differential for this part again. In the relatively short period of time that I've been using this hand, I've had to make several sets of replacement outer plates for the differential because I keep shearing off the drive pins. Because of that, I'm either going back to the Lincoln lever design that so reliably powered the 156 hand, or I'm going to a winder setup. I'm kind of leaning towards the chain winder because it's really compact, has a relatively low part count, and has a pretty novel appearance. I'll make a prototype of it when it comes time for that part in the build. If it turns out to be strong enough and fits with the aesthetic, it could be a real nice addition. We'll see. This leads us to the gimbal. Not really a lot to say about the gimbal. The five bearing design that I used on the 158 has proven to be super reliable and pretty low maintenance, far more so than the four bearing setup they used with the 156. The use of dual thrust bearings and a single deep groove bearing really locks the gimbal to the socket and eliminates any perpendicular rotation of the two parts. Lastly, add-ons. The other day while I was out to lunch, a guy came up to me and marveled at my hand. And at the conclusion of our conversation, he commented that he thought it'd be super cool if I had retractable blades mounted to the back of my prosthetic. I replied, yeah, that'd be cool. And I definitely think about his suggestion in a future build. So as cool as it would be to have some 12 inch semi-automatic out the front knife short sword as part of my prosthetic hand, packing around a weapon that's going to be deployed at best infrequently, but more likely never isn't worth the problems that it would be likely to cause. I mean, could you imagine I'm out in the wild, someone comes up to me asking questions about my hand, and as I'm showing them the different grip patterns, click, a 12 inch skewer comes rocketing out of the back of my hand. Depending upon the audience and proximity of any nearby Karens, I could be looking at an impromptu interview with law enforcement and a concealed weapons charge. So as cool as it would be for that once in a never occasion, I'm going to pass on that piece of hardware. Now something that I have been thinking about adding to my build for quite a while, but have yet to really work it out, is a set of mounting points for our wristwatch. Sure, like everyone else in the modern world, I use my cell phone to tell time, but I really think that the right mechanical watch could really look nice with the rest of what I have going on. We'll see if it makes it to this build or not. That concludes episode one of Missing Parts Monday. As always, please like, subscribe, and share my videos. And if you have time, please leave a comment in the comment section. Thanks for watching.